Yeah, thank you. So yeah, like I said, today we'll just be beginning with the IMDG and more of it will be the introduction. What do we understand by the IMDG? And of course, the terms and um, terminology um, as well. Does anybody, can anybody tell me what, what do you understand by this IMDG code? So I'll see whether we have some background. Anyone, or I'll start calling out names. Mm. Uh, good evening, sir. Hey, good morning, November. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm fine, sir. And you? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm good. I'm good. Um, so let's just uh, what do you understand when you see IMDG? What what do you understand by IMDG? Uh IMDG is uh International Maritime Dangerous Good Code, which is mm -hmm. part of uh uh documents which is required to be carried by vessels carrying dangerous goods. Mm. Yeah, thank dangerous you. Goods. Mm -hmm. So it gives uh, the UN name, you can get the UN number of the goods, of the particular goods, either in package form or, or uh, in other, any other way to package. And you can also get how to Okay. Uh, let's, yeah. Let 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 let's let's hold on there, uh, Lima November. Uh, most of my answers here, I've drawn it from the past questions of um of the IMDG. That's the oral questions. That's especially from the Massa International. So I'm coming back to you, Lima November. When I say, what do you understand by the IMDG code? What I mean is exactly what is the uh, what I've put on the screen right now is for you to bring in what you've step you've talked about, which is the dangerous good, and try to tell me why on why on earth they brought in an IMDG code to be able to take care of this dangerous good. So can you come again? I'll give you some expo on the screen and come in with your need to knowledge and let's join it together. So what do you understand by the IMDG code if you are asked by any examiner? Okay, it's a code which gives basic knowledge and safety handling of dangerous goods carried on board. Okay, yeah, that's good. And that follow-up question, what's a dangerous good? Uh, goods that are, when it comes in contact with the, either the marine environment or the human body, they are dangerous, they are toxic. Mm. So as long as, they are able to come in contact with marine environment and human body. They are toxic. Yeah. Are you sure? Mm. They are harmful. <laughs> harmful. Yeah, they, they are harmful. They are highly at risk, but they don't really have to come in contact with marine environment or the uh, human body before they are toxic. And this is kind of a tricky question from one of the examiners that I've seen. And that's why I'm just trying to dissect it from the beginning. So I'm going to answer that in, in the standard way if anybody will, will write. But first of all, I will need someone to just try and let's crack it up. What do you understand by dangerous goods? The word dangerous goods. Um, see me, are you there? I think Ola Toye wants to speak. Yeah, a dangerous goods uh, oh. are good that that dangerous uh, to to the body or to the atmosphere, to the environment in general. Like the a dangerous goods are goods that are toxic. To the environment. Mm. Good evening, Cap. Yeah, good evening. Uh, sorry, I just got here. My network was kind of done. I just got your question. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. Does anybody know the other ones? Yes. 
Yes, sir. Do you think it's a dangerous good? Yes, in some kind of way, sir. Do we use it? Yes, we use it. Why is it not killing us? Uh, reason being that... It's, like, not tricky, it's not a tricky question. I'm just trying to make you see reasons. You get that even if we... I mean, we, it doesn't have to be dangerous to the human skin. It doesn't have to be dangerous per se to the marine environment. But it has to be controlled, and that's what makes it a dangerous good. Now, the standard answer for what is a dangerous good that Captain Jackson was um, expecting is dangerous goods are substances and articles. So they can be substances, they can be articles in any form that conform to the criteria contained within the IMDG code. That's it. Anything that doesn't count, that is not found in your IMDG code, when you are talking of the DG list, it's not a dangerous good under the IMDG code. Are you following me? So it doesn't really have to be deadly. So even though it's not deadly at all, or even though you yourself, you don't see any harm in it, uh, but it's in the IMDG code, then it is a dangerous good. And you will find that in what I call the dangerous good list in the part three, part three of the volume two. So that's kind of coming as, you know, just the question of where people are going, oh, is ample to the substance, ample. Some might not even be ample, but as long as they are articles or substances that are found in the IMGG code, then they are classified as a DG, as a dangerous good. So I'll come again. Dangerous good are substances and articles that conform to the criteria, conf I mean, conform to the criteria contained within the IMGG code. So now what is this IMGG code now trying to do? It's now trying to enhance the safe um, transportation of, this, of these goods. It's trying to also protect the marine environment and facilitates you know, free unrestricted movement of dangerous goods. And when I mean free unrestricted movement of dangerous goods, like, like for instance, we have um, radioactive materials being carried on board. Like myself, when I was still working in, um, in offshore, we carry a lot of radioactive uh, material, but without a proper and structured guideline and methodology, we will not be able to carry this out continuously because it's either you are putting the crew at risk, you're putting the mining environment at risk, mining property at risk, or you're just not going to even be able to carry it at all. And that's why there are many structures in place which we will go into, uh, okay, let's say you are carrying methan methanol, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Where are you going to put it? What's, what's in place? What, what are the methodology that you're putting in place? So that's why the DG list is really quite very important. That's just the foundation. So a DG, a dangerous good, is any substances or articles sir, that conform with the criteria contained within the IMDG um, code. So, so what's, this, what's this IMDG code? And I've seen another um, uncommon question about, about it as well. Who brought out the IMDG code? Can someone tell me? Does anybody know? It's not tricky. It's still the United Nations. So the United Nations in bringing out regulation of regulations, they brought out the IMG uh, code, and of course the International Maritime Organization is quite under the the United um, Nations as well. And I think it was brought in 1954, if um, if I'm not wrong, 1954. So yeah, let's shoot now into what this IMDG code was it um, entail. So like I said, it's is the, the IMO, which is um, a UN specialized agency working on the, working in the maritime sector under the, um, the, the UN. 
are the one who developed this. They develop, of course, the solar, they develop the maple, which we've already, um, which we've already discussed about as well. So under these two, they've been able also to develop this IMDG um, DG code um, as well. And yeah, it has been made mandatory since 2004. And now what are the principles that we're using for this IMDG code? And the reason why I put this, um, put this as well is for people to be able to understand because some people look like, oh, what, what's even the essence of the IMDG? IMDG code, if something is dangerous, then why not just have a generic methodology in, um, in transporting them? But no, the first thing is an international like a grid system. So it's not a system whereas Mobi wants to do their own, Total wants to do their own, UK wants to do their own, Japan wants to do their own, Greece wants to do their own. But everybody is coming down together and to find a well-structured methodology in moving and transporting dangerous goods that have been classified under the IMGG code. So group, with like group dangerous goods together based on the hazard and present it in the transport classification. So there are three types of group which we'll look into, um, hazard group which we'll look into in the, um, in the course of the whole um, course. There's a group one, there's the group two, and there is group three. And the reason why they grouped all this is based on the severity, um, the severity of the hazard itself on how dangerous it is medium dangerous and of course very very um, very very dangerous. Then also it contains you know dangerous goods in packaging. How how we how are we going to be packaging them? Um, like for instance, if you are shipping petrol on on like rural ships, what are this what are the um, safeguard that you need to put in place? Because of course shipping a large amount of petrol on like ships or in passenger ships, you're going to be able to cause a lot of hazard and, 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 and damage. But at the same time, what are the emergency um, preparedness plan that you are using as well? Then very, very important is using hazard warning labels. And that's why when I started by using the, uh, the PEF and the deodorant, you, if you go back to your deodorant and see, um, you will really see some signs of the, the DG code um, in it as well. But most of the DG codes, I mean, most of the DG goods, we are able to know them by their labels. That's why labels is really very, very important. Now also standards documentation. And this is one of the questions that this came out during my own chief mates um, as well. What are the documentations that we need to transport the dangerous group? So it's not like just taking a cup of um, a cup and then dropping it on the ship for transportation. No matter how, if this cup is dangerous, it must have label, it must have documentation why it's being um, transported um, as well. Then it lays down principles for ensuring that dangerous with which react dangerously are kept apart. And that's where we come under the segregation column of the DG, of the IMDG code um, as well. Then it also lays down principles of where to place the dangerous good on board on board the ship. So, if, for instance, if you are carrying a I mean, if it's a container vessel and you're carrying a container full of dangerous goods, there is a particular place, and most especially for radioactive uh, materials, they will make sure they will ask the vessel to have a designated place away from the quarters, away from where um, crew or passengers. Uh, are staying as well. Then very, very important, of course, is the EMS is to provide the emergency response advice for, you know, for dangerous good in case of there's a fire, in case of spillage and in case uh, and on board ship. At the end of this, at the end of this series, we were supposed to do um, a dangerous good incident in the emergency procedure um, class. I skipped that but I'm going to bring it down here after this um, DG, uh, DG code too. Then updating, updating the IMDG code. This is another question which I've kind of found funny at that time until later I knew that the IMDG code is always updated every two, two years. The IMDG code, every obviously your IMDG code is always updated every two years. And what's, well, what are they updating? It's not like they're changing anything. 
but majorly what they are really what they are really doing is if there are new dangerous goods that they found maybe anyone has found it or there's new technology or there's new ways or methodology of handling dangerous goods and then they will just buy this up or if there's any you know safety concerns that needs reviewing they found out something new and stuff like that they buy it up and every two years we have a new revised IMDG code. So for, for guys on board, please try and check the latest IMDG. This is the latest one. It's 40, 4020. This is the 2020, uh, 2020 edition um, as well. So check which IMDG code do you have on board and make sure it's the is the updated one. Um, so surveyors check, but I scarcely used to see surveyors checking this this stuff and that's why I couldn't really understand it when when I was asked how many years was the IMGG code now updated during um, during my own chief mate. But later I found out yes every two two years and it's something that everybody should note because many ships now are still carrying expired or outdated um, IMDG code too. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, like, what should I venture in the uh, coming two years? Uh, there, there's no, there are known as an addition to the INDG, like, because you said it, it's been updated every two, two years, like, they get to update. What of if there are no discoveries of uh, new DG? or new methodologies of, of the IMDG's code? Like, how do we get to know, like, yes, if it's updated in this year, because there will be uh, different sectors or different uh, methodologies in which they have been using to convey the high, the DGs. So what if in a particular year, like we don't have a new invention or new discovery of other DGs? Like, would it be, would the IMDG code still remain the same or how will it still be upgraded? Uh, just a simple a little question, sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, that's a very, very important question. Um, I also asked the same um, as well, but research has shown that there is always something happening every two, two years with, with IMDG, um, with IMDG code. And remember that this is an internationally recognized um, ways, methodologies, and um, research going on as well. So China might pick up something and everybody, um, we need to agree on it too. So like I'm saying, so like I was saying, there is always something to up, um, update on the IMGD code. However, if there is for any reason, maybe in future sake, there is still nothing to update, the IMGD code must at least now carry the latest update um, yeah, as of year now, it's 40 um, dash 20, 40 dash 20, 2020 edition. So it's the same as your um, nautical, uh, nautical publications, um, your sailing directions that it gets uh, updated. Even though there is nothing to update, you will still at least see a new year's edition. Are you following me? So even if there's nothing to update inside this whole book, no problem, but at least, they will need to carry out um, a 20, they will need to carry a 2020, um, 2020 edition. Exactly. So like it's 2022 now, we should be expecting a new um, edition, which will start using in 20, um, 2023, but you can start using it from the ending of 2022. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I've been able to answer your question that the contents might be the same for the, um, what do you call it? The year's edition must change. So that at least that one is something that must change every every two years. However, when I was doing the advanced IMDG um, course, I asked the question: If there is something on the um, 2020 edition, and then the 2022 edition comes out, how will I be able to know what has changed? Are you following me? How will I be able to know that? they've made some changes because it's a whole lot of book for me to, you know, it's a whole lot of book for me to be reading the whole stuff and trying to find out 
what has changed and what has not changed um, as well. And I found out something interesting, but I've not seen any examiner ask this one, but it's just for your own. If you go down to, I'm just going to push this to the, to the camera. If you go down to your IMDG code, anybody on board or if you're in the library tomorrow, you can check your IMDG code. And you will see something like this. Oh, uh, gosh, my lap, laptop is not. Yeah, you see something like this mark here. Huh? That mark shows that there's been a review um, there, maybe something has been amended, something has been deleted, removed, or or corrected too, um, as well. So then I started noticing, and that is true. If you go down to any updated IMG, not, not even any updated, or even the outdated one, you will see this kind of mark in most of the points. So just know that that particular side there, if you check it against the previous revision, you will see some changes. So that's how you be able to know that, oh, they've actually changed something. Like this one now is the actual holding time for, for parking and tank provision. And they've actually changed the dates. The dates uh, the date at which the actual holding time ends shall be entered in the transport document. I don't know what was in the, in the previous one. Um, if you check the previous one, it will be so different from this one. So, these are changes, and this is how also you'll be able to know the changes. Thanks for that question. I've been able to at least try and address that one. I'm seeing another one here, which is special parking provision. And then it puts this, um, this dot there as well. Anywhere you see any of these dots, just know that they've done changes on this particular clause, uh, this particular clause of this code as well. But like I said, there is always changes. Well, however, if there is no change, it's just like your annual uh, summary of um, notes to minors. You will at least get the latest edition. The front one will tell you this is 2020, 2021, 2022. This one also will tell you what edition um, you are carrying. I hope that answered that question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. If you have any questions, just keep bringing. You can just stop me. Um, stop me at um, at any time um, as well. I I was talking about um, parking group um, before, and I was talking about we have three parking groups. The three parking groups will still go down to it, but I've seen it in a question. I just I'm doing. I'm going to say this like almost a thousand times throughout the time of this course is parking uh, parking groups are divided into three. For IMDG. So anywhere you see parking group is either you have parking group one, parking group two, and parking group three. And parking group one is this DG as IS danger. I'll just put it I danger. But it's normal on the DG on the IMDG code, it's I danger for parking group one. Then parking group two, it has medium danger, no problem. And then parking group three, it has low danger. Because uh, I saw it in uh, in some other report, like, okay, can you tell me about the parking group of IMDG? And trust me, this guy went bizarre because even if it was me, I wouldn't have been able to capture that. But yeah, parking group are divided into three. The one has the highest danger, parking group two has medium danger, and parking group three has the uh as a low danger. Let me put it that uh, that way as well. So yeah, coming back again to the IMDG code itself. The code, Metal code comprises of seven parts. We'll break it down. And it's presented in two, um, in two books and a supplement. Because that's another question again. So how many volumes of IMDG codes do we have? And the guy actually paid for saying three. I know it's three. I know it looks like three, sorry. I think that part. I know it looks like three, but the third one, which is always a very nice, interesting thing. It's called supplement. It's not volume three. So we have IMGG code volume one, volume two, and a supplement. So please, please, and please, if they ask you um, how many volumes of the IMGG, I know yes, you normally see three on board. No, but go back and check. The third one is actually um, actually a supplement. And like I said, this IMGG code is used to you know, obtain the required information on the DG list. I deal with DG a lot. And if someone just brings up something like 
like methanol. My first reference is down to this book. And the first reference is down to this book. And I'll teach you how we go down there. You see that you have the proper shipping name of the UN number, but the IMDG code stipulates us to have both. So that in case the proper shipping name is not properly spelled, you can at least go down to the UN number and you can correlate them together. And like I said, the code has a supplement. And I put it, I clearly put it here. And if you see that I separated it away from the supplement, it's presented in two books. It's volume one and volume two. The third one, now supplement. Please, please, and please. Because so, someone has, so, yeah? Can we then now say like, yes, we only have one and two. And then the supplement. So we not. So one will not convince is ourself. Like when you're being asked, how, how many high MDG code do you have in the situation? But like the word, when you stated, you said there, there is the dangerous, the highest dangerous, and then the medium, and then the lowest. For me, I would have picked it as three. <clears throat> so if you are saying IMDG code now, are we saying we are having two IMDG code and one supplement? If I'm asked, if I'm being asked, like how many IMDG code do we have? Am I to say three or two and a supplement? No. Um, Olate, you're getting it, but I need to get it very well. I'm not talking about the the packing group that I was actually referring to. It's still something I'll still talk about later. I don't want to confuse you with that. The, I'll just go again and explain that packing group is totally different. So like, for instance, now, this is kind of a pizza I, I bought when I came back from work. And the contents of this stuff with the packing, the DG, IMDG code itself, we try and tell you, is this um, group one, group two, or group three? And then this cup as well, this cup is just containing C. Is it group one, group two, or group three? So for every, I mean, for not every DG, but for most of the DG, we're going to be having a packing group, which I'll go into that. That's totally separate from this. Now, what we're talking about here is every DG, which is dangerous goods, and their properties and whatever information that you want about the, DJ, um, the dangerous good is contained in, in three books. And because I just don't want us to forget about the supplement, but it's contained in three books. It's contained in, in the volume one and the volume one, which I'll go into um, as well, contain all that other information, um, segregation, separation, and, um, and, and all whatnot. Then the volume two contains the DG list itself. And then we have a supplement. So for the IMDG code, IMDG code is presented in two volumes and one supplement. Did you understand me? Or you would like me to explain? I, I understand it, yes, I understand it. Yeah, so IMDG code is presented in two volumes and one supplement. That's what I'm trying to get it to get. Then packing group is something in depth, which we'll go, uh, we'll go into. And the reason I try to bring that up is because it's, it's coming up and coming up and coming up. And it's something I really want to address from even from the start to, to the end, uh, to the end of it as well. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up so that it doesn't cause any confusion um, in any way. So yeah. The layout of the IMGD um, code, like I was saying, the first one, uh, which is the part one of it, it contains the general provisions, general provisions, um, the definitions, the the training um, too, and that's that's more of just it's kind of like a manual. I'll put it that way, or a guide. But sometimes people. People are really sometimes I really can't get it because it's looking like a lot to to go into. But if at any point you'll be able to to go into that, um, especially that part one on the general provisions, on definitions, definition unit of measurement, and abbreviations that you might go and find there. It's basically it's, it's giving you full information 
about what you want to, I mean, about the whole code itself and what you'll be expected to do within this code and stuff like that. And also it's giving you things like, you know, security, um, security provisions and, and all whatnot. That's that what you find in the, in the part one. I think security provisions, uh, training, and mostly I haven't seen guys doing training, but it's mostly it's um, the requirements is for everyone to have an IMGD training every two two years, both especially the shop and of course the people on the ship, um, especially the people on the ship as well with high managerial positions handling the IMGD code um, too. So yeah. The, AMG, the part one is the general provisions, the definitions, and then the, tra the training. And then the part, part two now comes into the classifications. Classifications of IMGG. Can someone tell me off, off their head how many class of um, IMGG um, dangerous goods do we have? I'm seeing a chat I cannot access here. Is someone able to tell me? Nine, thank you. Um, yeah, that's that, that's kind of the common questions, classes of um, classes of the IMDG, which I'll be going into next after this uh, after this slide too. But yeah, the, the whole classes of the IMDG. So if you pick, if you want to have a good read about the the IMDG code, it's majorly the part one and then the part the part one and the part two, and it gives you extensive knowledge about what is expected, what is what is expected of you, what is it even tries to teach you how to even use the um, use the IMDG code as well. And then it comes down to the classification and tries to break it down, which if time permits, we, you know, we time has to permit, but we'll have to go down into classification at least today on the classes of the um, of the IMDG code. And of course, I'll be bringing in between all those questions that are found on this IMDG and putting it out into as well. So if you can really see, yeah, like someone said, we have nine classes of um, IMDG. Then going down to part four, all these things are still in the volume one. All these things are still in the volume one. And this is now the packing and the tank provision. The um, the part five, the part five of it also is the consignment, proce consignment procedure, what is expected. And the construction, the testing, the packaging, the IBC, uh, the portable tanks is will be found on the on the part six of it, and of course the part seven is more of the transport um, the requirement for the transport um, operations. That's when we're talking of the requirement for transport operation, we are talking about you know the segregation, the um, separation, and, and all whatnot. And the reason why they are bringing all these things in different different parts is when you go down to the DG list. The DG list, you see it. The DG list, we try to specify, okay, where if you have a UN number, what, where are you going to put it? How are you going to separate it? So when you are talking about separation and segregation, we come down to seven. When you are talking about tanks, we come down to six and, and all whatnot. Then moving down to the next, uh, next slide, that's when we have the most interesting part of the IMDG code as well. So the first part of the IMDG code is the DG list. So the DG list contains every uh, list, every item, article, or substance that conforms to the IMDG code. They are found in the DG list. So no matter how you think that this material is um, is dangerous, yeah, it can be dangerous. But if it's not under the DG list. It's not classified as an IMDG, um, IMDG code in every way. If you have any doubt, if this is kind of like an extensive class, um, being an expert, I have ways of, you know, taking a cup of tea and then putting this, uh, using the um, characteristics of this tea, I will be able to find out, okay, where can I put this? And does it even conform to any DG list? This is how people are able to yes use this methodology to confirm okay yes i think this is the dg list or something if it especially if it's a new chemical they try and find out but that would be another extensive class as well but majorly what i needed to find is what i need to know is every dg 
uh, very dangerous good must be found on the DG list. And this DG list is where you have your interesting volume too, as well. So every packaging or any um, dangerous good must come with you know the proper shipping name and the UN number. You have the UN number and then the proper shipping name, and you are able to go check the class, the subsidiary hazard, the packing group, and uh, like I was telling you, um, the special provision, the limited and accepted quantities, the packing. Uh, how to pack it, how to pack it itself, IBC and all whatnot, um, so as well. Now, Appendix A of this um, of this book, and Appendix A of this book gives you, gives us like a list of generic um, NOS that's not otherwise specified. So, like I told you, you might be having like like I said, this cup of tea and your own little mind or yeah i can say my own little mind i can say no i think this is kind of dangerous then i start going to go and start finding out okay um how can this can this fit into any dg it's its own self and that's when i start going to go break it down using this um not otherwise um not otherwise specified and try to bring out a proper i can bring out a proper shipping name and a dg list as long as i'm able to to clarify, but it also I need to use other characteristics um, for it as well. Then the another interesting one is the alphabetical index. Alphabetical index now shows another interesting slide, which this one I, I, I came to find out um, of, uh, of recent, that was after I passed my exams. But if you have um, a substance and you don't know the proper shipping, I mean, you don't know the UN number, sorry, and you don't know the UN number because the first the first thing people like to use is the UN number to try and get the proper shipping name. But if you have just the name without the UN number, then you have to come to where this alphabetical index is. So hear me and hear me well. When we open this book, is it now you have the UN number? If you have the UN number, you come straight down to the forward. And if you have UN3126, you know it's a self-eating solid corrosive organic. But if you have just self eating solid corrosive organic, just, just the name itself, that's when we come down to the last part of volume two, which is the alphabetical index, and it contains every single digit um, list. So we take that and then we go back to the UN number to get the full, the full details um, of it. So now to our supplement, like we've been saying things. And the supplement is is this green book. Like I said, guys, it's please let's like a lot of you has tried to you know by set this for us. It's two volumes and one supplement. Many people have made that mistake of I don't even want to say it so that it doesn't stick into anybody's head. But I am GG code is two volumes and one supplement. And now what does this supplement do? And like I wrote here, the supplement contains text relating to, to the code on emergency response procedures for ship carrying dangerous goods. So what's the emergency response procedure, especially for, you know, for radioactive, Lima November was speaking about it's coming in contact with, um, with the body. And she was also speaking, I think she was speaking about it's coming in contact with, you know, other goods um, itself. Like for instance, you are carrying fire on board. What's, what's the methodology that we use? What's the procedure, what's the emergency procedure? Then it still contains the medical first aid guide. So all these medical first aid guides, like what you must really have on board. Reporting procedures. If you have a DG incidence, who do you report to? If you have a DG name, who do you report to um, as well? And the IMO guidelines for you know packing the cargo transport units. Then the safe use, but you can also have insecticide also. They will also be inside. Then the international code for the carriage of package, um, Dated nuclear fuel, platinum, and high level radioactive waste on board ship. Here you will find them. So it's more of it's more of the emergency procedures, first um, first aid, and um, reporting reporting procedures. This is kind of like aftermath. Uh, it's not only aftermath, though, but contingency and aftermath when there is any um, any incidents um, as well. So yeah, with that being said. Let's move into classification. And sometimes I, I ask the question, why, why are they making things very, very difficult for us, for God's sake? 
why why going into so much classification just tell us the name and then we can try and find out what to do or what not to do but no the classifications will help us you know to distinguish which are considered to be dangerous for for transport and which one are not considered to be dangerous for you know for for transport itself and it will just help us in immediately you see it you'll be able to identify the um the dangers that these are presented by like the way you take care of a radioactive you will not even want to go near it as long as you just know that this thing falls under radioactive you don't want to go near it there's so many theory but most especially even the practical side it's harmful to you itself but when you see petrol yeah you can go near it but there are other things now that should stay away from you know from the petrol so these are the reasons why they are just able to so you don't need to have to say okay is this um <laughs> you know if you have to know what is inside the container before you know you know whether to stay clear away from it or not to stay clear, um, clear away from it as well then it's also ensure you know correct measures like i've just said are taken to this good to be transported without risk to personnel or or property um too as well so like i said methanol is dangerous radioactive i like to use that example is dangerous but the way you're going to touch radioactive is not the way you touch methanol you don't even know what is the that's the thing you don't know what is the radioactive item itself but you don't care but as long as you're able to see it's radioactive then you need to start putting the measures from far and that's why it's very very good for us to um classify it and someone has just rightly said it's classifying to nine. Like I said, it's according to their properties. And the way these classes are handled in transport will depend on the properties and hazard for, for example, the type of parking they um, use, the classes of dangerous goods that they will be transported and where they will be stored in the ports or in the ship too as well. So one, class one is ex um, explosive. I'm just going to pause here and go down to my second slide that I want to use in explaining this to as well. Just one minute, sorry. So, yeah. This is also quite important. The class one is explosives. So when we hear class one, and I think one of the examiners made me cram all these things that time, but it's just the class one, class two, class three, and then the um, the class four. And the class one are articles having mass explosive um, explosion um, hazard. Oh, can I can you can anybody see my screen? Are you seeing explosive? No, sir. What? Negative, sir. Negative. You can't see your screen, sir. Um, can only see. Okay. Just. Oh, someone's can't say they can see it. Yeah, can you can you see it now? What's on my screen is explosive now. Um two. So class one, class one, like I said, can anybody see it? If can you see you can drop me a chat or okay. Thank you. Um Lima November, can you see my screen? Well? Okay, yeah, 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 thank you. So like I said, um, quick one, uh, we have a few more minutes, but that's, um, that would be okay for us to take on the, yeah, thank you, uh, the classes of, um, of, of the IMGD. So the IMGD, the one, first one is explosive. So any article or substances that have mass explosion hazard, they classify it under, under this, um, and that is explosive and the explosive the class one is divided into we have the division 1.1 and this division 1.1 is forbidden for example to be forbidden to be loaded on cargo or passenger aircraft so we can start seeing the characteristics that um, these guys are using for it too 
as well. Then the division 1.2, the division 1.1, explosive and explosive. 1.1 is mass explosion. Then 1.2 is articles of substance having you know projection hazard, but not it's not like a massive explosion, uh, what like that. So like war edge rockets and those ones you can't do them on cargo or passenger aircraft. And 1.3, this is where something like you know petroleum comes in and other kind of stuff like that. But it's articles and substance having fire hazard, a minor blast hazard, but it's not a massive um, explosion. Then 1.4 is articles and substances presenting like no significant um, hazard, like you know signal smoke. Signal smoke is also um, an IMDG. Um, as well, it's it's a UN UN number zero one nine seven two. So that's one point four and one point five are very insensitive substances having mass um, having a mass explosion um, hazard. So that's like blasting um, agents. And you can see you can see as I'm opening it, you can see their their sign. So once you see this thing one point five blasting agent, you should know stay clear of them. So and then one point six is extremely insensitive articles which do not have a mass explosion um, hazard. So now let's go down to gases itself. And for the gases, we have two point one, two point two, and two point three. And in two point one, we have the flammable gases, which is like hydrogen. And one of my ships they carry hydrogen, and we have to comply with this a lot, um, a lot. Um, and going through the IMDG code can be a bit tricky with this one. But once you see um, class two, it's gases, and we have class 2.1 flammable gas, non flammable glass 2.2, and that is non or non toxic gas. You can see that the colors are changing as I'm as I'm going through um, as well. That's like refrigerated liquid also, and we have toxic gases. We have toxic gases, so flammable gas, non flammable and toxic gases. So this is like oil gas, compressed or salt. Then class, class three is um, the flammable, flammable liquids too. And that's now when you have your petrol, your, your petrol, your diesel and other, you know, high explosive uh, flammable liquid as well. So these are liquids containing solids in solution, especially example, paints, vanishings, uh, which gives flammable vapor of temperature of more than 60 degrees or liquid desensitive uh, um, explosive um, as well. So maintain, maintain all, all these kind of things are not going to be carried on passenger aircraft as long as they fall under this classification. So we have flammable solid. So I want to come back again. We have the gases, the flammable, and flammable, flammable solid. Flammable solids are self-reacting substances and um, desensitized um, explosive like matches, wax, and others too. Um, the four points, we are the four points one, and the four points one, we can see the, you don't need to cram this, this image itself, but as much as you can try and remember these images, they to really help you um, in just seeing these things from far as well. Then substances like with the spontaneous um, combustion, that's another flammable, um, liquid, um, I mean, flammable solid. There are substances which come in contact with water, and this is where Lima November, you know, was 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 talking about them um, as well. So it's coming in contact with the mine environment, which of course we're looking at it is water. So it's dangerous when it's wet, and that's when they will stick it down to to 4.3 and um, water reactive. So we should know where we keep this kind of stuff. It should be far away from um from from water or from anywhere that can go over but oxidizing um agent like these ones are like fertilizers fertilizers are, are classified under this as well so this themselves they are not combustible but may contribute to the combustion of any other material by yielding oxygen so you kind of assist in the fire triangle process in yielding um, in yielding oxygen. The organic per organic peroxide are sensitive to impact and they react with any other substance and they cause damages to the eyes. This so you going near this one, they should you'll be able to tell you under the EMS is keep clear away from it, from your body, from contact with your body, your eyes especially. 6.1 toxics. 
um, toxic and infectious materials, and these are liable to cause death. So even seeing the skeleton alone, you should not know this is, apart from even being paid on IMDG, it's dangerous, it's highly dangerous. So as you can see, as I'm changing, you can see that the labels are also changing. So you seeing it from far, you should be able to know, okay, this is a class of um, dangerous good for this. So toxic substances which are liable to cause death or injury or may cause human else if it's swallowed, inhaled, or contacted. So it may be by inhalation, injection, um, injection um, as well, or contact with the body. Infection uh, 6.2, infection substances which will cause pathogen or disease in animals, human animals and uh, human in human and animals. And I think during the coronavirus time, they were trying to tag these under, I mean tag blood samples carrying um, COVID um, COVID samples, especially for the ferries from some ferries that live in the inner house, and they have to send the samples down to the nearest hospital. They were trying to target under this, but I think there was an argument. But this is um, kind of in special substances. So you've seen it from far, you should know, no, this is kind of virus itself. Radioactive substances, we see this a lot in um, on supply, uh, supply ships as well, but you can notice, and they are, they, they carry to primary risk which is like if you are in direct contact with them or you are just close around them and then the um the radiation is getting close to you and it's really very very um very very harmful um, as well we also have packages for this i'll not go into this today i'll come back to it tomorrow in ways that which we can the more you're able to package this and i've seen this practical live it's if you have a very highly radioactive materials if you're able to package it properly and you still carry a scanner and scan it, it will tell you zero. But opening the package down to the substance itself, you will see the whole meter beeping and it's really, really very dangerous at that point. So the packaging of radioactive substances and very materials are very, 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 very crucial and important too. And yeah, categories will go into it, um, not today, uh, next week um, as well. But this is really kind of important. And I think I saw it also in Aura's or as a report on how to label your um, radioactive material or even any material itself, is it radioactive one, two, or three. Corrosive substance, like you can see it's substances, and this is corrosive substance, white and black, uh, it, and you can see how the, the label is, meaning if it comes in contact with any material or it comes in contact with your hand or anything, it's really gonna hurt you a lot. So paying full attention to the handling of this is really very important. So we will tell you don't use your hand to, to handle it. So it's substances whereby chemical reaction can cause severe damage when in contact with living tissues or in the case of leaking. So if it's leaking, we materially cause damage or even destroy other goods. So substances like this, they will not even require you to put it on top of any other good. Substances like this, when it's leaking, you should really be able to report it because it's a major hazard on its own. Then miscellaneous are any substances which during transport present a danger not covered by other, uh, other classes. So those ones can be um, aviation, um, yeah, they can just be some other, they can be materials, microorganisms. They are not listed in other ones, but they are really kind of dangerous too, um, as well. They have, but they don't, the only thing about this one is um, miscellaneous DG. It's kind of, it was a tricky question is, does it have any hazard? No, it doesn't have any direct hazard. It does not have any direct as a ball, as long as it's be able to present, I mean, present a damage when, when it's being transported, then it's being classified under, um, under the miscellaneous um, as well. And yeah, that's, that's it for, um, for the classes of the, of the DG. So I will pause here. It's, it's nine, it's a um, few minutes past, uh, past nine. And next week now we'll be going into the proper, which will be opening the, the IMGG code and using the UN number, the PS, um, the UN number, the PSN. If you have any question, you can get ready to ask me. But we're using the UN number, the PSN, to try and find out the characteristics of the, of the dangerous group, to try and find out the segregation, to try and find out the packing group, the packing, 
um, yeah, the parking group, the parking, and also another tricky question, and this one really failed me during my achievement. I didn't know it then. What was what is accepted quantity? So accepted quantity and limited quantity. This this fall under this try. This is for chief mates, most especially for chief mates. Uh, as what is accepted quantity, what is limited quantity. So we'll we'll deal with that, and I'll try and just simplify it in a way that we'll understand next week as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Uh, there is a stop share. And does anybody have any question so far? Thank you. Um, I kind of know it's a lot, it's a lot to take in, but the best way to just try and do this is if, if like I said, if you have any, any IMGG book, just try and going through it, um, and bring up questions and we'll be able to to, to talk more about it. But the most important part for the IMDG is being able to open your volume two and be able to pick out your UN number, proper shipping name, and order. I are you able to go to find other um, information about this particular um, dangerous good as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much for, for coming.